Okay, so hello and a very good afternoon to everybody. I'm Dr. Mohsen Saif and I'm an interventional cardiologist at Armed Forces Institute of Cardiology, AFIC, National Institute of Heart Diseases, Raul Chindi. I welcome you all to this webinar on challenging interventional cases. I'm grateful to Guest Pharma for extending their support in arranging this event. Today, we have a blend of some very interesting cases, both from the United Kingdom and from Pakistan. There are a total of six cases, three from UK and three from Pakistan. For all those who have joined us online, please feel free to ask questions to make it more interactive. May I remind my respective presenters that the time allocated for each presentation is 10 minutes with five minutes of questions and comments. I extend a very warm welcome to our expert, Professor Dr. Farhan Tayyab, who is the Commandant and Executive Director of Armed Forces Institute of Cardiology, National Institute of Heart Diseases, Rahul Pindi. I'm also joined by my co-moderator, Dr. Suhail Khan from UK. Dr. Khan is a consultant interventional cardiologist at Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Birmingham. He will be also presenting his first case titled, It's Not Over Until the Case Has Finished. Over to you, Dr. Khan. Right, so uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening to uh, colleagues. So thank you very much for uh, joining this webinar. And uh, as Dr. Saif has said, we're grateful to our uh, colleagues at Getz Pharma for putting together this uh, uh, webinar for us uh, and managing the technical aspects. I'm going to just open up my uh, presentation here and uh, I'll just share that with you in a, in a second. So I'm hoping that uh, you can uh, all see my slides. Uh, the, the case is entitled, uh, it's not over until the case has uh, finished. And as uh, mentioned, I work as a consultant cardiologist at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in the uh, United uh, Kingdom. Uh, but before we move on to the case, I just wanted to share uh, some of our uh, links that we have as a uh, training institution. So we have been in uh, collaboration uh, with the Armed Forces Institute of Cardiology for over a decade now. Uh, and fellows have uh, been invited over on a competitive basis to attend the Queen Elizabeth Hospital for training in advanced interventional uh, cardiology. Uh, this picture on the right, you can see that uh, this was a visit just last March, just before the lockdown started in the uh, UK. I'd uh, been invited to take part in their uh, annual meeting. In fact, we performed the first laser atherectomy case uh, and OCT case uh, in uh, Pakistan during this uh, live webinar series. So it's good to see old fellows who are now consultants in their own right, uh, working very hard in this uh, fantastic institution. Um, the astute ones amongst you will, will notice that uh, on the badge here, it says Brigadier uh, uh, Farhan. Uh, first of all, I just want to congratulate uh, Brigadier Farhan. He's no longer a Brigadier. He's now a Major General after his promotion and uh, Commandant of the uh, a fantastic institution. So, you know, we've been lucky to have this uh, uh, collaboration for over a, a decade, and it's just one of the centers that we collaborate with across the world, uh, training uh, fellows uh, and improving cardiology care uh, for patients. So on, on to the case. Uh, the, the case that I've got for you today is a 67-year-old uh, gentleman who's presented uh, with symptoms of worsening breathlessness. But actually, in hindsight, uh, he did mention that he'd had a central dull ache three or four days uh, prior to uh, presentation. He is uh, diabetic, and you can see his first troponin was significantly uh, elevated at over 10,000. Uh, he has mild degree of uh, renal impairment. Now, his ECG showed uh, he'd lost his anterior R waves, essentially. Um, he had a very small flicker of an R wave uh, anteriorly, some ST segment depression in the uh, lateral and inferior leads, and maybe with the eye of faith, uh, possible elevation in AVR. Uh, he was admitted and underwent an echocardiogram, and, and you can see that uh, the echocardiogram shows that uh, he's got a severe impairment of his LV function. His, his ejection fraction was estimated at around uh, 30 to 35%. 
there were no significant uh, valve abnormalities. The LV function um, was impaired, but you can see that the wall of the anterior, the anterior wall was not thinned or uh, a, um, a kinetic. It was more sort of hypokinetic. So at this uh, stage, he was brought forward for um, coronary angiogram. Uh, and the angiogram, as you can see, shows that he's got significant distal left main stem disease. Uh, I'll show you a couple of other pictures on the next slide, but there's also disease extending down, affecting his proximal uh, LAD down to the mid LAD. And the actual LAD itself is pretty ropey looking. Uh, the second diagonal is quite a large uh, branch. The spider view shows the bifurcation very nicely. He's essentially got a Medina 111 uh, bifurcation. Uh, the right coronary artery had sort of mild to moderate disease, but was actually in fact uh, quite a large uh, vessel extending all the way around uh, to the apex. So he was taken off the table uh, at this stage with a plan to be discussed at our MDT. Uh, and the discussion essentially focused around uh, the LV impairment. Uh, and our surgeons were quite keen to get some more information about whether or not he had uh, viability in his anterior wall before considering him for surgery. Now the MRI showed that uh, the mid and apical anterior wall were infarcted uh, essentially, but there was uh, movement in the basal and the mid anteroseptal wall, which were uh, deemed to be hypokinetic. And similar to the echocardiogram, the RV function was uh, felt to be normal with only a moderate degree of uh, mitral regurgitation. So on the basis of this, he was accepted uh, for surgery. Now, whilst waiting for surgery, of course, his ticagrelor had been uh, discontinued. Uh, and unfortunately, on uh, around day five, uh, he had a VF arrest. This was relatively early in the morning. It got up to go to the bathroom and collapsed. Uh, was found to be in uh, VF, successfully uh, shocked back to sinus rhythm, uh, had a short period of uh, CPR, um, and his blood pressure at this stage was around 95 systolic. Uh, lactate was uh, elevated, not surprisingly, and he was transferred to the cardiac cath lab in this sort of borderline uh, cardiogenic shock uh, situation. Now, wh when he arrived, he was a, a little bit restless, and we felt that actually we should probably uh, ventilate this uh, gentleman before considering uh, where, where we go in terms of treating his uh, coronary anatomy. So the anaesthetist kindly put him to sleep uh, and tubed him. Now in our centre, uh, and I'm sure our, our colleagues from Pakistan will, will uh, uh, attest to this, we, we are a big impeller centre uh, and the decision was to uh, put an impeller catheter up to support uh, this gentleman's uh, left ventricular function. We do this uh, by obtaining access to the right femoral artery uh, with a micropuncture and ultrasound to ensure that uh, uh, we minimize our femoral complication rate. So those of you not uh, familiar with the impeller catheter, essentially it's a microaxial pump. Uh, it, it sits on a uh, pig, pigtail and the pigtail is positioned in the left ventricle. It has an inlet and an outlet uh, and the uh, rotation of the uh, microaxial pump, which is connected to this automated controller, is uh, 50,000 RPM. It then allows blood to be sucked from the uh, left ventricle out into the ascending aorta across the aortic valve. And there are many advantages to having this. Uh, we know that uh, it increases your cardiac output, it reduces your L, the end diastolic pressure, and increases coronary perfusion. And the automated controller then also gives you some further information as well. So it will tell you about your impeller flow. It will tell you about the motor current. And more and most importantly, it will tell you about the placement signal and the pressures that you're achieving. So this is the impeller being uh, positioned. It usually goes through this 14 French uh, peel away sheath. Uh, it comes with its own 0.018 uh, wire. And once you've crossed the aortic valve uh, with a standard uh, pigtail catheter, you switch out over this wire and the impeller is then railroaded into the left ventricle. Now, the other thing that we've uh, learned over the last uh, year or so, and what we've started to uh, introduce in our center as well, is this uh, concept of single access uh, uh, for impeller cases. And the reason for doing that is that your patient has one uh, less access site that you have to uh, deal with 
So hopefully the complication rates are lower. Uh, you introduce your second axis through the impeller. Uh, this is uh, impeller is a 14 French sheath and you can easily squeeze a nine French uh, sheath next to it, which allows you to do the whole case uh, through one single access site. So we proceeded uh, uh, to Ivis, this gentleman's uh, left main stem. The Ivis showed that actually uh, there was moderate degree of calcification. It didn't require rotivation, uh, we felt, and we went ahead and proceeded to a two stent uh, strategy because uh, as I mentioned, this was a Medina 111 uh, calcified vessel, but also involving the ostium of the circumflex. So 3.5 NC balloon went up uh, relatively easily in the left uh, main stem. I'm just going to talk you through very quickly the some of the steps, important steps in the DK crush. So you stent the side branch. This is a 3.0 stent in the circumflex. We decided uh, not to go to the uh, very ostium of the vessel here. So just a few millimeters out into the uh, left main stem. Um, the important thing is then to pull back your side branch, oh, sorry, your stent balloon and flare to high pressure. And the reason for doing this is this will help open up the uh, cells into the side branch, which allows your access um, to be much easier when you're trying to recross. You then perform a high pressure uh, non-compliant balloon inflation. This is a 4.0 NC in the left main stem going up to 20 atmospheres of pressure. As you can see, I'm quite comfortable jailing the wire at this stage. I've never had a problem uh, removing a workhorse wire. And that wire also allows you to uh, access the side branch through a proximal strut. And this is what you're seeing here. So we've accessed the uh, proximal strut into the side branch. And if you've uh, post dilated with an NC to high pressure and flared adequately, you should be able to squeeze a 2.0 or even a 2.5 into your uh, side branch. Then it's a case of performing your first kissing balloon inflation. This is a 3.5 in the side branch, 4.0 in the left main stem. The left main stem was then stented. This is a 3.5 stent. Uh, as I said, we don't come back to the ostium here. Uh, the ibis showed the ostium was uh, clear. We didn't need to stent all the way back to the ostium. Uh, proximal optimization is then uh, performed and then we rewire and perform our kissing balloon. Uh, and this was our result on the IVUS. Uh, it's always important to perform an IVUS uh, in your patients when you're doing left main stem uh, stenting. Uh, we ended up stenting the diagonal as well uh, in this patient. You can see on the IVUS pullback, we've got well opposed stent struts throughout in the diagonal coming back into the uh, left main stem. Uh, what you want to do is to measure your uh, minimal stent areas and ideally in the left main stem the recent data suggests that you want a, an area which is above 11 millimeters squared uh, which reduces your risk of uh, mace for your patient so you can see well opposed stent uh, all the way back into the uh, left main stem the angiogram appearance was also uh, very good and you can see we've put a um, uh, NG tube in here uh, to administer ticagrelor for this uh, gentleman. So at this stage, we were considering what to do with the uh, impeller. And we felt we probably ought to leave the impeller in for a, a short period of time. Uh, the gentleman was going to be transferred back to the, uh, uh, to the intensive care unit. And when you, when you uh, leave the impeller in place, what you have to do is to remove the peel away sheath. Um, and essentially you you crack open the hub, uh, peel away the sheath, um, and then the, uh, there's a second uh, sheath which is then railroaded. Uh, it's a, a sheath which is tapered and is railroaded over this uh, impeller. Now, invariably, when you do this, um, the patient uh, oozes blood from the groin, so you have to have a second operator usually pressing on the groin. And at times, uh, and uh, I'm sure people will attest to this who are impeller implanters, you either end up either pulling the impeller catheter back or, uh, or pushing it forward just to make sure that uh, it doesn't get pulled out of the uh, ventricle when you're doing this uh, maneuver. Now, unfortunately, when we, when we were doing that, um, uh, we suddenly had no tracing uh, on the impeller automated controller. And we did a screen and we could see what the problem was. The problem here was that the impeller catheter had uh, kinked uh, and it's kinked just proximal to the inlet valve. 
And as a result, the automated controller is showing that there is no pressure being uh, generated. So clearly this was a, a big uh, concern. We weren't quite sure where this impeller catheter was. Now, fortunately, because the patient was uh, ventilated, we were able to put down a, a TOE probe. And in the mid esophageal long axis view, you can see uh, what's happened here is the, the impeller has managed to embed itself uh, into the mitral valve apparatus. Uh, and it's probably impinging also on the uh, um, uh, papillary muscle. So this is a, a schematic of that. Uh, remember the mitral valve has these uh, cordy attached, which attach to the papillary muscle. And I think what had happened here is that the impeller in my uh, approach of uh, trying to ensure that it doesn't get pulled out when I'm removing the peel away sheath, I've pushed it in too far and it's wrapped itself around this papillary muscle uh, mitral cordy apparatus. So we were left in a little bit of a conundrum in terms of how we, how we try and uh, uh, get this out. Now, uh, obviously we promptly called for a surgeon because it was looking very likely that we would have to uh, think about a surgical approach. Uh, whilst the surgeon was arriving, actually, one of my colleagues uh, thought about uh, whether we should put a second uh, uh, sheath in and think about snaring this device, not, not to pull the device, but actually to uh, allow the device to be prolapsed back into the left ventricle. So we've got uh, the end snare device. This is a very nice, uh, neat uh, device. It's got three nitinol rings. It's much better than the gooseneck uh, snare. Some of you may have uh, used that. Uh, it increases your uh, capture rate by threefold because it's got these three nitinol intertwined uh, loops. And you can see what I've done here is I've managed to snag the proximal end of the uh, pigtail. This was sticking out into the um, ascending aorta. Uh, and then I've prolapsed this back with a multi-purpose eight French guide back into the uh, left ventricle. Uh, and then using the tip of the uh, end snare device, I've, uh, that's allowed me then to free up the uh, tip of the pigtail catheter and to uh, disentangle myself from the uh, mitral apparatus. So fortunately we were able using this uh, trick to re uh, remove the uh, device from the left ventricle. Now clearly we weren't going to leave the impeller in place now. We weren't quite sure what the state of affairs were with this impeller and we decided to uh, take the impeller out. Now in my practice, I've started using the Manta Collagen uh, plug closure device. This uh, comes in two sizes uh, and the, it's very similar to the um, Angioseal device, but obviously has the ability to close uh, larger holes. Uh, the nice thing about it is that you've got this radio opaque marker on it. So if you ever need to access the vessel again, uh, immediately afterwards, you have the ability to do that because uh, the radio opaque marker allows you to ensure that you don't go back into the uh, same site. Um, and it can co close the big uh, um, uh, uh, device, the 18 French can close holes up to uh, 25 French. So the gentleman uh, was transferred back up to the uh, intensive care unit. He had a, a little bit of a rocky course up there. He had quite a prolonged uh, admission on our ITU. Uh, I'm pleased to say, however, that uh, after his ITU stay, he was stepped down to the wards. Um, he's still with us uh, at the moment, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to send him home in the next uh, few days. You can see after revascularization, his uh, LV function has uh, picked up, his ejection fraction is uh, much improved. And I'm hopeful that, uh, as I said, uh, we should be going home uh, sometime next week. So just to conclude the case, what I've shared with you today is a, is a complex, uh, successful uh, PCI to the left main stem with uh, impeller support. Uh, unexpected complications can arise and will arise, and you need to know how to manage them and be able to think through in a logical manner. Um, there are coronary complications that can be dealt with by using a second guiding catheter, uh, stuck rotor blur, blur, for example, or coronary perforation. And I think this is the third one that we can add to this uh, list as well. Uh, and remember that, that you know when you're when you're dealt with a complication like this, you've got to think on your feet and 
there are many skills that we have as interventional cardiologists, and these are transferable skills. Uh, and certainly knowing that uh, this second access uh, trick uh, allowed me to be successfully bailed out of this uh, particular uh, near disaster. That's great. Thank you very much. To next case. What a very exciting case, Dr. Khan. Uh, in fact, we haven't seen such a case before. It's really interesting. Thank you. If I can just... Dr. Khan, to the next. Alex. Alex, Alex so, sorry, sorry. Alex, you want to ask something? Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, I think just, uh, I mean, so many fantastic cases and so many learning points. Perhaps mm -hmm. representing some of uh, our audience uh, that are not very familiar with DK Crush. Uh, so, Hill, you used a seven French guy catheter. Can a DK crush be easily be performed with a, a six French guy catheter? What's your experience and what's your advice? Yeah, so uh, absolutely. So I think if I hadn't put the impeller in this gentleman, remember, you can railroad a seven French up uh, through the peel away sheath. But if uh, you need to do a DK crush, you can absolutely do them through six French guiding catheters. And in fact, that's what we usually do. Uh, and we do that through the radial approach. Uh, we've never had any problems. Uh, seven French gives you a little bit more uh, wiggle room, uh, but you know, absolutely six French is the way forward. Uh, can I ask a question? This is Dr. Uh, Nadir Khan from Karachi. Yes, please go, go ahead. Uh, uh, in the uh, DK crash that you did, uh, your circumflex stent was uh, quite close to the ostium of the left main. And the LED stent was a bit behind it, which crushed the circumflex stent in the end. So my question is that, uh, can you get away with less protrusion of the circumflex stent uh, uh, into the left main rather than protruding it go back uh, into the left main just close to the ostium? Uh, yes, yeah, so actually, I did a classical DK crush, and in the classical DK crush, it's advised to have three or four millimeters coming back into the uh, main vessel in the left main stem. Uh, that's the one that I do routinely. Uh, I don't advocate doing this thing called the mini crush. Uh, the problem with the mini crush is that you risk missing the ostium of the uh, side branch, and that's exactly what you want to try and avoid doing. So remember, if you've got enough strut, stent struts hanging back, uh, the important thing is when you're doing your kiss that you want to cover the, um, uh, the uh, bifurcation angle. And you can only do that if you've got enough stents uh, hanging back into the uh, main vessel, in my opinion. So yes, there is this technique out there called the, the mini crush. Uh, there isn't any data uh, apart from bench data to uh, support the uh, use of that technique. Of course, this is a, a technique which has good randomized control data to it. So this is uh, why I went ahead with this particular technique. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's sort of counterintuitive, isn't it? To have a bit more metal work backwards, but there's no doubt it, it actually simplifies the technique really. And, and there's no need to worry about it. It, it gets squashed behind the, um, the second stent. So I think there's no, no concerns there. Uh, as Sahel says, it's got great evidence behind it. And thanks to Sahel, he's really pushed this technique at our institution. I think we've all started to do it. We've all got really good results. It's been a, a major step forward. Okay, so in the interest of time, uh, Dr. Khan, shall we move, move on to the next case then? Yes, absolutely. So uh, it's a, a great pleasure then to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Narcis Samor, a, a great uh, colleague who I've worked with on several occasions on my visits uh, to Pakistan. Uh, he's going to present a case mm -hmm. entitled Change the Plan, uh, Not the Goal. Looking forward to it. Go ahead. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Is everybody listening to me? Yes, we, we, can, we can hear you. So if you could go ahead and share your slides, that would be great. The great, great case management by Dr. Khan. Excellent, mashallah. Uh, this, uh, my case is a relatively simple case. Next slide, please. So this patient is a 45 years old gentleman, a known diabetic and hypertensive, non-smoker without any family history of ischemic heart disease, 
he suffered acute inferior wall MI and was thrombolyzed in a local hospital. He presented to us with uh, post MI angina of CCS class 2 a couple of weeks later. And uh, on physical examination, there was no detectable abnormalities. And uh, his baseline lab investigations were also normal. However, his echocardiography revealed uh, ejection fraction of 45% with inflammatory wall uh, hypokinesia. Uh, we booked him for uh, diagnostic or an angiogram with ad hoc PCI. And uh, his angiogram, as you can see, revealed a dominant left system with a critical osteolean in the left circumflex. Uh, as uh, there was no uh, adequate uh, foothold in the left circumflex osteum, so we, it, we changed the plan and we, instead of doing it as an ad hoc case, we made it an elective uh, case. So, uh, according to Marina classification, this was a 001 lien. And uh, before proceeding to the elective PCI, we subjected the patient to myocardial perfusion imaging, which revealed severe reversible ischemia and the infolactive wall of the left ventricle with global viability. Now, once we booked him for the elective PCI, uh, we we reviewed his, uh, his we took his picture and uh, we had a couple of options in our mind. One was the provisional stenting and the other one was uh, upfront to stent technique. As the uh, LED ostium was relatively healthy and it uh, apparently it appeared as a simple case, we thought of just doing a crossover from left main to circumflex. So we. Uh, we did the wire, we placed BMW into LED as well as into circumflex. And uh, before actually ballooning, we did, we did his IVUS. And the IVUS revealed a uh, critical uh, lien at the ostium of the circumflex. And actually this atheroma was extending well into the left main stem. And uh, we decided to uh, do the left main to circumflex PCI. So we uh, prepared the lien with the 2.5 into 15 balloon for the pre dilatation. And we took a relatively longer stand, which was 4 into 24 drug leaving stand to cover the left main to circumflex lien. And now you can see there is a pinch at the ostium of the LED and there is a slight mismatch in the, in the outflow of the stent. We did the pot and uh, the, uh, the pain persisted and the patient started having chest pain and he developed EC changes. Now, uh, there was a complication which we had to handle. There were a couple of options again. One was just to do the balloon dilatation alone and the other was putting in another stent by adopting one of the bifurcation stenting techniques. So amongst the second stent deployment techniques, uh, we had uh, tap, internal plus, crush, and culotte. We did uh, the wire duality with the run-through wire, and we took a smaller balloon, which was 1.515, and we pre-dilated, opened the studs, and then we took a bigger balloon, which was 2.5 into 15. Despite uh, adequate ballooning, the patient continued to have chest pain. And we, uh, instead of just doing the optimization with the balloon, we decided to put in a stent from left main to LED as well. And as we were, uh, as, as the size of the LED was good and we were comfortable with QLOT technique, so we decided to do a QLOT. We selected 3.5 into 18 uh, uh, drug looting stand and placed de and deployed in left main to LED. And we uh, did the pot with the same used balloon, which was 4.5 into 8. And then we declosed the circumflex with run through wire and uh, took initially smaller balloon, which was 1.5 into 15, and then 2.5 into 15 balloon and opened the stars. 
But the final case, we took 3.5 into 15 balloon, both for LED as well as for the circumflex, and did the final kissing balloon inflation. And then finally, we did the pot. And uh, this was again 4.5 into 8 balloon. And you can see uh, a good result with some reduction in the TV flow in the LED, which prevented us from further ballooning. And we stopped here. To conclude, left main stand PCI is never a simple affair. Even in a case like a simple case like this, you can get complications. The operator should be well conversant with the bifurcation techniques before jumping onto left main stand PCI. The complications, complications should be anticipated and the possible bailout, bailout plans should be well thought out. Cath lab should be well equipped with the disposables and devices and operators should be comfortable in changing the plan. Thank you very much. That's, uh, that's a fantastic case, uh, Dr. Samora, and, and lots of things uh, to discuss. So uh, why don't I, I kick off the uh, discussion? So uh, clearly what you've got there is a, a dominant circumflex uh, system. So it's a very important uh, circumflex and, and no doubt that's probably why you had a, such a large burden of ischemia in the infralateral wall uh, territory. I was just wondering, uh, I mean, we know that on Medina classification, this would be a 001, as you've said, but did you think about putting the IVUS probe down the LED at the outset because you'd already put the IVUS into the circumflex back into the left main stem? And what we've learned is that actually when you do IVUS the LED in these situations, you often find that there is atheroma at the ostium of the LED. And I just wonder if you'd seen that, whether you would have changed your initial strategy um, uh, in terms of your stenting? I think that is a very uh, valid point, but uh, we initially thought that this LED appears uh, relatively healthy. We just did IVAS to circumflex and left main stem, and we just assessed, we just assessed the size of left main stem and circumflex and the distribution of atheroma. Yeah, I know I've taken on similar cases and, and had Similar events, really. Where, and, and I think too often you have to go back and do something to the other vessel. And since the health point is very good, if you interrogate that vessel first, first of all, you often find that it is diseased and, and then go for perhaps a DK crush solution and two stents up front. So, you know, it's, um, it's sobering, isn't it? But you've got, I mean, you know, congratulations, you got yourself out of a, of a, a slightly tricky position beautifully and got a nice result in the end. So, well done. Uh, I mean, I'd I don't know what from comments are hail on the relative results of um, Colop versus DK Crush. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess we have some studies. Uh, the, the biggest is the DK Crush series, which tells us that maybe uh, DK Crush is better in this situation than uh, a Culot. But having said that, I think most operators are more comfortable doing uh, culotte stenting, certainly in, in Europe. I don't know if that's the case in, in Asia because I know DK Crush has taken off in a big way uh, in the Asian subcontinent um, and operators are getting more familiar with uh, DK Crush as their main two stent strategy. Um, you know, DK Crush compared to culotte in this situation will uh, reduce your target vessel failure rate um, particularly at the ostium of the circumflex. And what was interesting to see on the, on the final angiogram, I don't know whether you either stat or not at the end, there, there was a little bit of a restriction at the ostium of the circumflex. And that this is invariably the place where you end up having restenosis in cases like this. Yeah, there's a, there's a limit to how big you can get that, um, that, that circle of metal, isn't there? That's yes. So you're slightly, yeah. slightly limited by the technique in this case. Yeah. But, but hopefully you'll get a great long-term result there, in, in this course. Yeah, so that's great. Uh, we are live on uh, Facebook as well, so I, I'd encourage people who are watching on live, if there are any questions uh, that come up during the uh, cases, then you know please do put them into the chat. We'll try and address those uh, questions as they come in. Um, it is a, 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 um, a seminar for everybody, um, so we want you to participate in this. I'm going to uh, hand you back now to uh, my uh, co-moderator, um, Dr. Mohsen Saif. He, he's going to introduce the uh, next speaker in the next case. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
So now I'll, I'll invite Professor John Townend to uh, present his case. Uh, Professor Townend is a consultant interventional cardiologist at Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Birmingham. And uh, I learned so much from him once I was working at UE Hospital back in 2003 and 4. So the title of his case is When Stents Don't Work. Over to you. Sir. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, it was a, it was a great pleasure to work with you and, uh, and many of the other AFIC fellows as well. We had, a, we had some good time. Is that, uh, is that sharing? So this is a, a can, you, can you see and hear me okay? Uh, yes, we can, John. This is a picture of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in the, in the range on the COVID epidemic with um, all these ambulances um, in a line. It was uh, put up by one of our junior doctors who was leaving the hospital in a rather disgruntled state. I think he was not, not happy. Anyway, in the middle of all this, um, or just before this actually, I'd just come back from a holiday uh, abroad, which I managed to sneak in before the first lockdown. Uh, and I came back, uh, and my first catalyst of my holidays was uh, this 72 year old uh, lady who's fairly typical of our patients, uh, slightly elderly South Asian female who uh, presented with a twins boy history of typical chest pain. Her background, uh, as ever, she's diabetic, she's overweight, she has no alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, you know, diseases of the, uh, of the modern age, hypertension and borderline uh, renal function. She's stable, she's in only in mild pain by the time she arrives. Recently, remarkably abnormal, sort of left ventricular hypertrophy pattern, really, rather than ischemia, but certainly very abnormal. Uh, and her troponin was elevated. Uh, and uh, we were in a good position at the time, so we took her straight away for uh, the same day uh, angio. Um, so here's the angio. The right column is small, not quite recessive, I don't think, and perhaps it's a, a, a sort of sort of a PDA coming off that, but it's so small as to be uh, not very uh, not very important. Uh, here's the left side. There are lots of atheroma. You can, your eyes immediately go on to that uh, proximal circumflex lesion and to that diffuse disease in the LAD. Uh, and here's a better view of the LAD. See sort of moderate plaques in the, in the proximal vessel and severe disease in the mid and distal vessel. So heavy burden of atheroma, um, high risk patients. So we uh, uh, took her off the table uh, and thought about what we should do with her. We did an, angi uh, uh, an echocardiogram, which is good lepidotic function. We discussed her at the MDT and on balance, everybody thought that although there are some confused uh, options, that perhaps the option of treatment would be bypass surgery. Um, so we, uh, we went back to her and said you need to stay in hospital and wait for surgery, which she was happy to, to go for. Uh, and then the uh, COVID epidemic really hit, uh, and uh, pretty much surgery was, uh, was almost closed down. Third option was closed off to her. So the whole thing wasted for two weeks, uh, and it became evident that surgery really wasn't going to happen. Uh, so we thought we should do a PCR procedure. But we wanted to do a procedure that would um, not preclude the, the, the option of surgery in the future. Um, uh, we were really looking at this as a sort of holding procedure as much as anything. And we thought we should perhaps try um, stenting that circumflex uh, and then perhaps try and see if we go away some double eating balloons to the LAD um, and hope that the uh, proximal LAD atheroma would, uh, would stay stable with medical therapy. Uh, and we weren't going to touch that right thing when it's such a small lesson. So uh, two weeks after the initial angiogram, we brought her back to the cath lab. Uh, and we started on working with skirt. So you can see a pretty tight lesion there. We did standard stuff really pretty related with the 2.5 millimeter balloon. Um, there's a lot of this worry about it. it's difficult to size certain flexes, and I could teach that um, they're always a little bit smaller than you think, and you can embarrass yourself if you put in the, uh, the size of stent that you think it should be. Um, so perhaps I. Um, you know, it's a bit conservative here. I put in a 3A stent, but I post a loaded with 3.5 millimeter balloons, a high pressure, uh, and ended up with well, what I think was a pretty, pretty fair result. So we then well, moved on uh, and did the LAD. Uh, and there it is. It's been, but most of these are actually quite distal. Uh, and we pre dilated with the 2.5 and the 2.75 millimeter balloons, and then used a long 2.75 by 30 uh, Pachytaxel drug leaking balloon. Uh, and that's the final result. And you can see that it's quite deceptive in the distal vessel there. And we hovered over whether we should fix that. Show you a bit more detail there. 
But I thought, you know, it's not, there's no, there's no die holder. It's a, uh, it's not too bad. We should, we should hang by. You know, I'm old enough to remember when, when we did uh, balloon angel plastic before we had stint. And actually, we probably would have said, you know, that's not, that's not too bad a result. So we declined the temptation to put in a stent uh, and left it. Uh, and she went home the following day uh, and was fine for a while. In fact, she was fine for seven months. Uh, and I rang her up with one of our telephone review sessions and um, she uh, she was fine. Uh, and then she turned up for the week's history of intermittent chest pain with an ECG that, that didn't show any new changes and the troponin that wasn't elevated. Um, but she continued to experience pain despite a couple of days of trial of medical therapy. Uh, and um, and so on the, on the basis that this is unstable and Johnny, she returned to the cath lab. And actually, so, so Hale, uh, you did this next bit, I don't know if you remember it. So there's the angiogram of the circumflex. You can see it's a really disappointing result, isn't it? Within six or seven months of the stent, she's got tight in stent use later. But you can see the LAD is really pretty nice. So actually, arguably, they've grown a little bit and perhaps have been some positive remodeling. So we then undertook uh, PCI to the circumflex, um, a uh, 3.0 by 15 cutting balloon was used, and then uh, circumflex with IVUS. Um, I won't take you through long IVUS pullbacks, but suffice it to say that the, uh, you know, as ever, the, the IVUS was, uh, was really helpful. And actually, that circumflex is not just a large vessel, it's a huge vessel. Um, this is just distal to the center, to the stems, and it measures 4.1 by 4.7 millimeters. Uh, and that's inside the stent. And you can see that at this point, although there's not much uh, neonatal proliferation within the stent, the stent is, is markedly undersized. So uh, the, um, the stent uh, was dilated up further with a 4 0 balloon, um, which perhaps not surprisingly caused some disruption to the outflow and required a further 4 0 stent distally, uh, and then a 4 0 uh, drug eluting balloon uh, to the proximal stent, uh, and left it looking enormous, as perhaps it should have been. So you can see now that actually although that um, that 4 a segment is uh, is large, it's definitely larger than the proximal vessel. It just shows you the uh, the size of this thing. Uh, and the LAD was also harvested, and again, so it's a much larger vessel than you think. Uh, loads of apparatus, um, but a big but a big vessel. So she's gone home. She's doing fine. Um, no more chest pain so far. Um, but I guess the lessons of this case, and I think they're, they're, they're simple, but I think they're worth repeating. You know, big vessels are not always evident on angiogram. You can, you can really undersize the vessel. This lady had a massive aparoma burden, huge amount of aparoma uh, on the angiogram, but even more on the iris. We know that drug eluting balloons can give some very good results, and we've got some great enthusiasts in the UK now who are starting to use drug eluting balloons actually uh, in preference to drug eluting stents. Um, because uh, if, you're, if you're fortunate, actually, uh, not only do you get uh, a good initial result, but actually you can get late positive remodeling and the vessel can grow, which is unlike a, a stent where usually the remodeling is, uh, is negative and you get a degree of, uh, of instead of um, Of course, that's much more the case if you undersize your stent, as I have to admit that I, that I did in this case, um, because I didn't use either stent the first time then. So the questions are, you know, how many how many cases should we do when we don't use IVUS? I think it's becoming a, a serious way. Can we start to use drug eluting balloons in place of stents? And then just with respect to this lady's future, given that very heavy aparoma burden, should she be considered for elective PCI to the proximal vessel or even a, a, a sort of prophylactic lemograph to that LAD uh, once we're all happy and vaccinated and safe? Um, or should we think about doing FFR? Uh, and my only thing about FFR is I've just spotted a, paper, a really interesting paper recently, which um, looked at um, non infarct related vessels in patients undergoing PCI for skin. Uh, and whether you should use FFR to determine whether you fix them uh, or just use visual inspection. And their, their slightly challenging result was that um, actually, if you use angiographic visual inspection, you can achieve a 60% reduction in the hard endpoints of non fatal infarction and cardiac death. Uh, but if you use FFR and start to leave any of these vessels alone, actually you lose that benefit. So maybe uh, uh, for these sort of cases, um, uh, angiographic visual inspection is actually superior to, uh, to FFR. So 
you know, I guess the, the, my final message is perhaps um, either one FFR, um, not nil, you know. Um, so that's my thing, and uh, be grateful for any, any comments or discussion. Uh, Mohsen, you are muted. Interesting case, uh, uh, Professor Townend, really. I mean, uh, normally, uh, I think we would have stented the LED. I don't know. Uh, I mean, what, what made you uh, think that you will, uh, I mean, that is better in this situation? Was it too distant LED? Was that the reason that you uh, did the dead rather than a stent or any other reason? Yeah. yeah. I think maybe the distal LED um, and that uh, you're very you know, aware that this lady really dropped, which we should have had a lemur graph that LED. And I didn't want to prevent her from getting the lemur graph at some stage in the future should she need it. You know, there's nothing worse than a surgeon coming to you saying, you know, look, look what a mess you've made of this. I, I can't even put a lemur graft on, which is the, the, the best, their best trick, arguably, because you've gone and stented exactly where I would insert my lemur graft. So I didn't, I didn't want that to happen to him. Okay, if you can't, if you can't see you, can you uh, please uh, stop that screen stop. sharing? Uh, yes. yeah. if, you can't, if you can't see any, 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 any one of you, really. Can I, can I make a comment? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, sure. Down in, uh, wonderful uh, case. Uh, I would just like to ask you a question uh, regarding the, the balloon you use. It's a biostream balloon that you mentioned because we are not familiar it with uh, familiar with it here. Please tell us some details about the balloon that uh, the drug coated balloon that you have. Yeah. Um, I mean, the original drug coated balloon data was largely with, um, with uh, a thing called sequent cleave, actually, um, yeah. which is now very expensive. Uh, and therefore, we have stopped using that on the grounds of cost, largely. Um, nearly all the drug coated balloons are, are packed with tactile. Um, diluting uh, on the grounds that that is a highly lipid or lipophilic compound and goes straight into the vessel. There is one, I think, serolum diluting balloon at the moment, which I've not yet seen any hard action data for. So, um, although they're pushing it very hard on the grounds that serolimus might be better than Papitaxo on stents, uh, I remain uh, a bit reserved on that one. And I think we should stick with the Papitaxo diluting balloons, which I think have the data for them. Uh, in terms of which, you know, there's been no head to head comparison, so I can't recommend. One Pakitaxel diluting balloon over another, I suspect they're, they're pretty equivalent really. The technology is simple, isn't it? You just take the balloon and allow the, uh, the drug to elute into, uh, into, the, into the lipid of the, uh, of the cell, of the, uh, of the vessel wall. I'm Dr. Nathan from Pakistan. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Tomlin, for sharing an excellent case. This is an elegant example of keep it simple. But there yeah. was some dissection in the LED. Why are you not worried about that? Yeah. The <laughs> I, was, I was a bit worried about it, um, but usually, you know, the, these things, if I get them to, to, to occlude on you, we'll do so within the first 24 hours, so we kept her a little bit extra time just to make sure, um, but I suppose, the, you know, the other thing it's worth pointing out is that in the days when we when we really were doing balloon angioplasty as the definitive technique rather than stenting, Actually, we were quite pleased to get a bit of a localised dissection. We used to think that that made a, a real difference to the vessel wall uh, and it would heal up in a much more fibrotic and stable manner, and that might be a good thing. So, providing that the, the, um, the vessel, the, the dissection isn't occlusive and you don't have lots of dye hang up, um, probably they, they're relatively safe to leave. Thank you. And, and the other thing is, of course, we're using powerful uh, dual angioplatic therapy now, which perhaps prevents a lot of the um, the early uh, occlusions that we used to get uh, before we, we knew what we were doing with, uh, with drug therapy. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Great case. So, uh, Dr. Sir Khan, are you happy to take on, take the, on this session from here? For the yes, uh, yes, absolutely. So, ju just a, a quick, a couple of quick points on that case from John. So, remember that we do now have the ultimate trial, which tells us that we should probably be using IVIS more often. Uh, for our PCI uh, patients. Uh, what the IVUS, uh, sorry, what the ultimate trial also showed us is how to optimize our stents once we've deployed them. And one of the, there are three things that you need to do. One is to ensure adequate expansion at the site of your uh, minimal luminal area, and you're trying to achieve a, 
uh, reference in uh, of around 100 or 90 percent or 100 percent in reference to your distal lumen, uh, ensuring there's no distal edge dissection, and you want to try and avoid stenting into plaque. So, and if you do that, you will reduce your target vessel failure rate uh, by a factor of uh, three. So you can have a less than 2% target vessel uh, failure rate. So I have to say, I've, I've taken up, I mean, I'm a big IVUS enthusiast anyway, but after that trial, um, I've taken up using IVUS even more. Um, and I don't have any qualms about bringing out my IVUS catheters uh, for cases like this. Um, so let's move on. We've got uh, uh, the next case now. So uh, let me just uh, bring up the agenda here. So yeah, so uh, the next case we've got is from uh, um, Dr. Ali Nawaz, um, out of the frying pan and into the fire. Uh, so, sounds like one of the cases you probably did with us. Was it? <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> okay, go, go ahead, uh, Ali. Have we, have we lost our colleagues? I think we're having a little bit of a, a technical uh, glitch. Uh, Happy to what, uh, go ahead and do that. Yes, yeah, so, so absolutely. So um, what we'll do uh, whilst we're waiting to get our connection back to uh, Pakistan, uh, we'll move to Alex uh, Zafiru. So Alex is one of my colleagues at the Queen Elizabeth uh, Hospital and I'm grateful for his participation in the meeting. He's going to talk to us about uh, a case that he did not to... Uh, 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 quite recently, it's called uh, Pleased as uh, Punch. So that's... Right, thanks very much for the invitation. I hope you can all hear me well. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see very familiar faces and great colleagues from Pakistan. So this is uh, a case of an 80-year-old man who uh, is of uh, of us, um, Asian uh, origin, diabetic, hypertensive, and had coronary artery disease for a long time and received a coronary artery bypass uh, set of grafts back in 1992. He represented in 2002, had PCI to his vein graft, going to his RCA, uh, represented in 2008. This time, both grafts were occluded. Uh, Lima was uh, remaining uh, in good condition uh, and that time in another center they elected to stand his uh, uh, native left main stem and circumflex so he had an occluded RCA and occluded vein graft to the RCA. Back in 2018 presented under the care of Dr. Town, Professor Townend to our center and he had an acute coronary syndrome due to a significant instant restenosis of the circumflex. He was treated with cutting balloons and a, a new stent implantation with good results. However, this time he continued to have angina. He was reviewed in my clinic with typical histo uh, history of angina. Uh, a Marcada perfusion imaging scan was performed and showed uh, big reversible ischemia to inferior and lateral territory. Uh, while he was waiting for his review, he presented himself with unstable angina. We were all hoping that he had perhaps instant restenosis, something easy to, to treat. Uh, however, uh, his previously implanted stents in the cycloplex looked good, apart from mild instant restenosis. And it became apparent that the culprit was his chronic total occlusion of his right coronary artery and the vein graft to that artery as well. So during that uh, cath, I performed an IBUS confirming that uh, Professor Townend's work was, uh, had good lasting results in the left main stem and circumflex. Briefly, I tried to get access to his RCA via the graft, but I failed. And that's not a surprise because we know that grafts that are occluded more than a year are very difficult to be to reopen and be used as a as a conduit to get access to the distal native uh, coronary artery bed. Um, this is the condition of the uh, native right coronary artery, so osteal disease, long segment of occlusion, so not a very attractive uh, artery. Um, and this is uh, his left main stem and circumflex OM. 
giving epicardial collapse are also a fairly large uh, uh, right coronary artery. This is me trying to open a vein graft without any uh, success. And that's what uh, I managed to achieve, achieve at the end of the procedure. You would agree, very disappointing. So second attempt to open his right coronary artery as the patient remained very symptomatic. This time we attempted to go retrogradely from the lima graft to his uh, right coronary artery by septal collaterals. Um, a challenging case. We gained access to a variety of septals, but we did not manage to position our wire in the distal right coronary artery. So although we access a number of uh, septals, we never managed to get a good wire position in the distal right coronary artery. We are always in, a, in small branches, but not where we wanted to be. So we then had a, a meeting and a thought about what else we could do. Oh, before I, before I mention that, uh, we managed to um, do an undergrade approach to the right, but unfortunately our wire uh, went to the RV branch without us being able to redirect the wire in the main right coronary artery. We did a, what we call an investment procedure and prepared the proximal uh, right coronary artery uh, by ballooning, creating hopefully micro tears that in the future could lead us to the main uh, right coronary artery uh, in a further attempt. So that's a so-called investment procedure. The COVID pandemic took place and his second uh, attempt, sorry, his third attempt did not take place as scheduled. Uh, instead, we ended up doing his third CTO procedure uh, about a year after the second one for various reasons, main, the main reason being the, the, the COVID pandemic. This time we decided to go bi-radially um, to use the uh, OM um, as um, access to the RCA and that uh, was, uh, the plan was to go by an epicardial collateral. We used a seven French uh, sheath in the left distal radial in the snuff box using this snuff box uh, puncture and the classical uh, right radial approach uh, using a six French uh, catheter there and sheath. So these were the catheters used and that's the first picture. Unfortunately, as you can see here, the, um, the RCA um, in the last sometime in the last 12 months, completely occluded. And although you can see a stump from the, uh, from the, the, the vein graft, there is no uh, undergrade flow at all, indicating an osteal occlusion of the RCA. Uh, we used a variety of catheters and we could not get any flow. So this added another extra level of complexity. Not only we had to use an epicardial collateral to do our procedure, but also we, uh, we were dealing with an osteally occluded RCA, thus preventing us doing any undergrade work. So uh, the case becoming extremely difficult. Nevertheless, we, uh, we uh, tried to... Um, uh, continue with our with our uh, efforts. Um, so this is the the uh, unmagnified view uh, of um, undergrading, sorry, retrograde injection. So we have the OM, we have a very tortured distal OM and epicardial collateral, and another bend here in the distal RCA. So this is another picture here uh, showing the length of the occlusion. This is roughly where the ostium of the RCA was, and this is where the retrograde flow comes. So a very long occlusion. So we use a, we use a long microcatheter called, say, 150, a, a sewer wire, which is a very soft uh, wire, able to negotiate very tortuous vessels, as you can see here. And this tortuosity here needs not to be underestimated is it took us about half an hour to cross about 10 millimeters of uh, 
severe tortuosity. Nevertheless, we gained access to the distal RCA, uh, and the next uh, task was to uh, try to negotiate that bend uh, in, the, uh, in the native RCA. Uh, and we couldn't, and we didn't know whether we were outside the vessel or not, so we did a micro-injection of contrast through the microcatheter, and this confirmed, confirmed that we were still in the, in the distal RCA. Uh, we had to change wire, and we had to use uh, a uh, scion, plain scion wire, which was robust enough to get us over, the, um, over that bend. And as a matter of fact, we managed to uh, go in one of the different branches uh, of the distal RCA, confirming that we were in the right place. So we redirected our wire to the main vessel. And uh, as a matter of fact, we took a very aggressive, sharp wire, uh, Confienza Pro 12, which allowed us to puncture the distal cap um, and advance our microcatheter over, uh, over the wire. For some reason, the slides are going backwards. Apologies for that. So, after puncturing the distal cup, we were able to advance our microcatheter as far as we could. And using again a very sharp wire, we eventually managed to go very close to uh, what we thought was the original um, occlusion. And as you can see here, we are. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead, Alex. We can hear yeah. So we managed, we managed to puncture uh, that very um, sort of solid occlusion somewhere around where the original ostium of the RCA was. For some reason, it's going back to that slide. Apologies for that. Let me try to get you to the right place. So this is the moment where we use a very sharp wire, Confianza Pro 12, a very robust wire, try to create now uh, to reconnect the proximal RCA with the aorta. So this catheter sits somewhere near where the ostium was, but we cannot be certain where the actual ostium is. So we have no uh, idea. Nevertheless, we puncture. We confirm that this is in the aorta. We advance our microcatheter, so the microcatheter is now in the aorta uh, as well. And as you can see, by advancing the microcatheter, we are able to advance the wire further, confirming that it's floating freely in the aorta somewhere. So great success there. But obviously, we cannot perform uh, a PCI using retrograde uh, wire only, we need to have undergrade wire. So using the microcatheter, we exchange to a double length wire, a G300. Uh, obviously, it's extremely difficult to target our um, uh, undergrade guiding catheter uh, because it's not sitting somewhere in the ostium but floating in the aorta. So uh, we use, again, the N snare uh, and we captured the wire, as you can see, the one end of the wire back in the undergrade catheter. And you can see here the technique. So we tried to capture as little as possible of the radio opaque segment of the wire and in it goes in our undergrade guide catheter. This allows us to externalize the other end of the wire. So we have now two ends uh, of the same wire to work with. Uh, and obviously, we proceeded as normally. Uh, you will see in this picture here, which is a, the, what we have. We have a, a, a huge loop, essentially, of the same wire. The guide catheters do not have to be engaged at the ostia. We can work with the catheters in the aorta because this loop gives us a huge support. And we can do whatever uh, we want. 
um, without having to engage the catheters. The microcatheter is withdrawn in the distal RCA, the balloon is, be, is waiting to be used, and we use this loop to perform balloon dilatation and stent implantation. And we did that, we uh, ballooned extensively uh, from the distal RCA to the ostium, and then there's the first stent goes up. The next level of difficulty was that we weren't sure where the ostium was, and we had you know, um, a lot of discussion where to place the, the stent that will cover the ostium. So, and you'll see now a great picture and uh, an unfortunate complication. So that's positioning the osteal stent. At that time, I injected supposedly gently, but it wasn't gentle enough. And this has created, because they, it wasn't a normal ostium there, um, the, the injection was enough to create a dissection in the wall of the aorta that tracked upwards and downwards, as you can see. So I'll let this picture play once more, so you can see there. Thankfully, the patient remained asymptomatic. Um, we carried on and optimized the test, we, uh, the stents implanted. Uh, and uh, this is an injection now. I didn't want to re-engage my catheter. But what I did instead, uh, instead I used a thrombus aspiration catheter export that I advanced within the stent. So that's the thrombus aspiration tip. And I used the lumen of the thrombus aspiration catheter to inject without having to re-engage the artery. Following that, we optimized with a 4-0 balloon and we finished the procedure without taking another uh, picture. This is the picture of the left confirming that we have no perforation uh, which is a recognized complication if you use epicardial collaterals. And a very satisfying finding is that all the collaterals cease to exist. So there's uh, the RCA uh, fields from uh, undergrade flow rather than retrograde, which is always a very satisfying uh, thing to see. So the lessons I learned from this procedure, epicardial collaterals can be used. Uh, there is a lot of fear um about using them but providing that you uh you learn the technique and that you observe some basic uh, principles that can be used and as always undergrade injections uh, have uh, in this situation have to be used extremely cautiously and perhaps next time i'll probably use an ibus to confirm that my stent is in the right place rather than try to inject contrast uh, this is a CT from the following day confirming that our stent was in the right place. They found a bit of uh, hematoma and thrombose dissection in the aorta. The patient was asymptomatic. However, his echo initially showed significant aortic regurgitation, but the following day he only had mild aortic regurgitation. So overall, good results. The patient was reviewed just two months ago, and he was grateful because he's been asymptomatic uh, for the first time in a long time. Thank you. Uh, call the mic. A wonderful case, uh, very out of box thinking, I would say, Alex. Uh, any, 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 any comments or questions? I think Dr. Samur wants to ask something. A great case, excellent, well job done. Uh, and my question is, uh, what was the type of stent which you put in the proximal RCA? It From was a, it was a three point five biometrics alpha. Okay. It wasn't a uh, covered stand. It was not. No. Have we lost connection? Not sure. Is there anybody from Pakistani can hear us? Yeah, uh, I'm here. I'm Dr. Khan from oh. Karachi. Oh, uh, yes, I can hear. Department. Looks like we may have lost connection again to the AFIC mm. National Institute. Can I so, make a comment? Yes, please go ahead, uh, Nardo, please. Uh, uh, it was very uh, brave of you, Alex, to stent uh, in an ostium that you know that it's probably not the real ostium of the right coronary artery. And as I was expecting, there was a dissection in the aorta, and sometimes it was you were very lucky to get away with it. And sometimes uh, you can end up in uh, trouble with that also. Yeah. So the, the, um, we know that uh, perhaps the ostium was not the original ostium, but we were pretty certain we were within the structure of the vessel. 
So mm. I don't think at any stage we are outside the structure of the vessel, but perhaps we weren't in the true lumen. Um, so um, I think it's fairly safe, and I think without the injection, we wouldn't have had the dissection. Uh, I don't think we went out, outside the structure of, uh, of the RCA at any time, and there are some additional injections using the tip of the microcatheter confirming that. But uh, I think it's, uh, yes, I agree. In theory, you could go outside the structure completely and that would have been a disaster, but we were quite confident that we never left the structure of the vessel. Marvelous case, excellent. Very nice. Alex, I've had a, I've had a aortic dissection as a complication of, a, of an osteoright coronary stent recently um, as well. And, and it makes you feel a bit uncomfortable, but actually the patient was fine. And then talking to a friend of mine, um, he had a, a similar, fairly large aortic dissection, and he really worried about it. And he called a surgeon, um, and the surgeon came along and said that needs fixing because it's a type A dissection, uh, and took the patient to theatre, and the patient died. Wow. I suspect most of these cases are much better left, actually, if you possibly can. And uh, most of these dissections you know, that you cause by catheter intubation will, will heal and are safer left to heal than, than operated on. Yes, I think that uh, unless the patients are involved and compromised from the dissection, it's, uh, it's the nature of the dissection that uh, allows it to heal, I think. It's very, very, very rare. And our surgeons here uh, have reiterated that on a number of occasions because obviously, you know, we have had other examples of iatrogenic aortic dissection. And, uh, you know, our experience is that they, they heal without any issues. I mean, some, sometimes I've taken to double stenting. I, do, I mean, there's no evidence base for this whatsoever, but double stenting the uh, ostium uh, where I've had an aortic dissection just to make sure that the uh, vessel doesn't close off. I mean, did, Alex, did you have any concerns if you've, if you've basically created a, a near, neo-ostium here uh, if you've stented coming out from the adventitia, that there is a higher risk of restenosis at the ostium there. And is that something you might uh, consider doing for this patient as well? Are we uh, connected? Yes, we are. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think, I think the chances as the chance of restenosis are, are, are relatively high here, admittedly. Um, we, we did post-dilate using a full zero NC at high pressure, uh, but you, you know, this is not your box standard uh, osteal RCA stenting, so I'll be guided by symptoms in his case. Uh, I'm not planning to bring him back. Um, to do any checkups, um, he's 80, um, you know, and it's this again, this is not a, a box standard case, um, but I'll be guided by symptoms and I'll be happy to investigate him again if he has symptoms. Okay, that's great. So I think uh, we've managed to connect once again with uh, AFIC. Um, so what we're going to do is to move to the next uh, presentation now. Um, and it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Ali Nawaz. Uh, Ali Nawaz was uh, one of our fellows. He's been back at the AFIC for a number of years, and he, he's going to talk to us about uh, a case out of the frying pan and into the fire. Go ahead, uh, Ali. So, you like so the title of my presentation is out of the frying pan into the fire. So I'm going to show you what a complex left main stem dissection PCI in a patient with a tortuous coronary arteries. As we know, coronary tortuosity increases the complexity and decreases the success rate of percutaneous coronary intervention by creating difficulty in wiring the artery and delivering angioplasty equipment such as the balloon and stents. So this 62-year-old gentleman who was an ex-smoker was admitted with a non-ST elevation MI. His ECG showed STT changes in the anterolateral leaves. 
echo showed a normal irrigation fraction. This proponent was raised and other baseline investigations were normal. So he was planned for an angiogram with query to proceed. So this was his angiogram, and it is clearly visible from these angiographic clips that he had an extreme top arterial state with more than two 90 degree bands in the area with a critical lesion in the proximal part, and there was a critical lesion in the a large ocean broad. In the green view, you can see this controversy and the disease in the distal area. So we started the angiogram from a transcameral approach because of a very weak radial artery. He had the diagnosis of a double vessel perennial artery disease, and the plan was to fix the LAD at the left side of the left side. His family was counseled for the procedure, and procedure related complications were explained to the family. In this case, the problems we were anticipating was the difficulty in wiring and advancement of equipment. And the possible solution in this case was to work, use a good backup support from the guide. Use a soft delivery catheter, prepare meticulously the vessel, and use trackable scanning. So we started with a work or wires, which were run through, and you can see from the first picture, because of the extreme controversy, it has to take a big turn. And once we finally wired the LED, there was some straightening of the vessel. And after that, the wiring of the diamond was a bit easy as compared to the LED. We took a small balloon just to dilate the distance. Ali, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, can I interrupt you for a while? Uh, Dr. Khan, can you hear me? Dr. Khan, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so I'm really sorry there is some uh, issues with the uh, breakdown, the far breakdown of the internet. If, if uh, during this presentation of Dr. Ali, if it happens again, please wait for us to come back to us again because then we'll shift the system to the generator, okay? Uh, okay, yes. No we, don't, we don't want you to go. No, we're not going anywhere. You can't get Thank rid you. of us that easily. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sorry, Ali. Okay. So we dilated both the distal as well as the proximal LED region. We dilated with the large balloons, the proximal part of the LED. And we were trying to fix the distal LED with a 275 stent, but we were unable to cross the stent. And while trying to pass the stent, and with a, a bit of pressure, everything came up. So there was now a TIMI-1 flow in the LED. The patient became quite symptomatic with chest pain. And now we have to fix this proximal lesion as well. Wiring of the RT was also very difficult initially, and now in this condition with a suboptimal result in the LED after ballooning, we have to rewire it, which was quite difficult. We used the same run through, but it was well, not possible to wire it, so we changed with a pilot 50, and with gentle manipulation, we wired the LED. We dilated very aggressively the LED, but still couldn't manage to find and pass anything from the proximal lesion. And we tried to take a guide liner. In the guide liner, we were unable to pass it with, with balloon anchoring. We were able to cross the guide liner to the mid LED. We stented the distal LED with a 27519 stent. And while trying to come back, the guide sucked in, into the left main and lead to an occlusive spiral dissection of the left main extending into the LED and the left side complex with Timmy zero flow at this time. The patient crashed on the table, a cord blue was initiated, and we decided what to do now. The blood pressure was about 30 millimeter of mercury, and he had severe bradycardia. The option was to pass a temporary pacemaker wire, insert in an intraortic balloon pump, ask for an emergency cabbage surgeon because of the difficult situation, or continue what we are good at, using stents and balloons. So we decided that we will send and balloon this thing. Luckily, the wire was quite deep in the LED with a good support. You can see still the stent balloon in the LED and the guide liner in the proximal bit. So we have to send it the LED first. So we took the 3.5 
24 cells and stented the proximal part, the left main to LED. And this led to restoration of TIMI3 Pro in the LED. At this time, the patient became a bit stable. The blood pressure rose from 30 to 90 millimeter of mercury. But he had still persistent left uh, chest pain with ECG changes. The cirque was still occluded. The different option was to leave the cirque like this and accept a limited infarct, but that was not an option because he was under cat lab, and we have to find out it's a really huge left circumflex. So we optimized the proximal stent with a four balloon and then tried to enter into the left circumflex to the new deployed stent from the left main to the LED. We entered into the left circumflex with a pilot 50, but were unable to move forward because of the dissection, and we were not sure where we are in, were in the dissection plane or where we were in the true lumen. So then we took a fine cross, engaged the first portion of the left circumflex, give a gentle injection with the contrast. And if you can see, there is an LA branch which is filling from the proximal left circumflex, which shows that we were in the true lumen. At this point, we changed with the fielder FC and tried to manipulate the spiral dissection and to get into the distal true lumen. But we were unable to enter into the true lumen distally. So then we changed with the pilot 200. With the help of the pilot 200 and gentle manipulation, it took a bit of time, but we managed to enter into the distal true lumen. The fine cross was advanced further. A check injection was made, which showed that we were in the true lumen. And we exchanged the pilot 200 with a run through wire. Okay, so after <laughs> confirming, then we have to change the wire with a run through wire. Now we have the wire which was in the true lumen. We have parked a large uh, balloon in the LED at 315. The plan was to pass a stent from the ostium, either to do either a or a T or a reverse crush. But none of the stent was, we were able to pass it from the left hand into the cell. The initial stent was 2.7528, but we couldn't manage to get into the left the complex. So we took a very small stent, which was a 2.7514, and we wanted just to go place it at the ostium of the left circumflex. And even with this small stent, and with the balloon anchoring in the LED, we were unable to move forward with the stent. So when, then we decided to change our plan and to do a reverse pirot. We deployed this stent with a 27514 from the left main to the left cell. Then did the pot with a large balloon, and then this time we just removed the uh, balloon from the LED. And now we have secured a TIMI 3 flow in both the vessel. After the hemodynamic stability of the operator as well as of the patient, we just reviewed the whole angiographic clips. We missed the ostium of the left main while stenting from the left main to the LED. And now we have a dissection which was distal to the stent in the left circumflex. We were unable to pass cross any stent from the left main to the left circumflex, but were able to pass with a balloon into the left circumflex. So again, with a balloon anchoring and with a guide liner, we tried to manage it to get into the circumflex. And once the guideliner was in, then removed the balloon and took another stent, which is a 27520 regulating stent, and I was left with the previous stent. The stent was deployed with restoration of TIMI 3 flow in the circumflex. The dissection was sealed with all the branches were uh, preserved. The first one was also there. So after stenting and optimizing both the LED and this circumflex, we recast the LED with a BMW wire, parked a 315 balloon into the LED, 
and another 275 balloon into the left circumflex. We did a kissing balloon inflation of the left main to LED and left main to self scale. Then we, as we have missed the ostium of the left main, then we took a four pulse stent and deployed at the ostium of the left main to just see the dissection at the ostium LED. It was then optimized with a 4.515 balloon at high pressure. And this was the final result. At the end of the procedure, the patient chest pain settled and there were no ECG changes. He was then shifted to the intensive care and he was discharged on the third post PCID. And he's asymptomatic since then. To conclude, percutaneous intervention of tortuous coronary arteries can be challenging. Complications associated with coronary tortuosity, such as dissection and stent loss, are common. And strategies that can improve procedure success, such as soft delivery catheters, deep guide intubation, multi-meticulous vessel preparation, and use of breakable stent may help to overcome this problem. Thank you very much. Uh, Ali, can I say uh, thank you very much for bringing that case? That's an absolutely uh, fantastic case and an absolutely fantastic save. I guess uh, the art of being a great interventionist is not only anticipating complications, uh, but obviously trying to prevent complications uh, and managing them when they do occur. And then having worked with you, I know that uh, you would have been the, the cool person in the room and you need to have a cool person in the room when something like this does occur, who's basically managing the show because you know, the, the skill set that you need uh, in something that goes terribly wrong during a case um, is uh, one of sort of mental stability so that you have the cath lab team as calm as possible. Um, I mean, in hindsight, do you think uh, you would have tackled this slightly differently and maybe thought about surgery for this patient? Because uh, you know this is a very calcified LED and you know you would have anticipated that getting stents down this LED would have been challenging um, and you would have realized that early on when you were wiring this vessel. Yes uh, because from the first picture it was clearly we seen that there was an extreme tortuosity and I was anticipating this that uh, it may be very difficult to wire it and after wiring it will be very difficult to pass balloon and stent through it. And once we started with it, although it was quite difficult to start with the wire with the LED, but the balloon went very well and very easily. So we were comfortable that we can uh, go and pass very small size of stents, but I was, I was not right at that time because in this case, considering the tortuosity, although the syntax score of this patient is quite low, he might have a benefit from the PCA as well. But considering the tortuosity calcification, Mario might have offered, offered him this, uh, a bypass before doing it electively, this case. Yeah, can I just add my congratulations? That was a beautiful save out of a really difficult case and a really unpleasant um, left main dissection. You did really, really well and just illustrates the importance of just staying calm and thinking through the, the options and, uh, and then deploying them appropriately. Um, yeah, well, well done. Um, I, I think I think some of those complications were were you know you had to when you went into that case you you knew that there, was, there, there could have been some real difficulties and you get suckered into these cases don't you because the balloon goes really easily and you think oh that's great you get encouraged and then all of a sudden the stents won't go and then and then it gets difficult and you know guide extension devices back up of the guide appropriate wires all the all the right things you did really well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I just quickly ask you? Uh, I think I think it's uh, it's, uh, it's a great case, and I'm so impressed that you managed to uh, access side branch the circumflex, having a stent covering the ostium, and having um, a dissection, an active dissection involving the circumflex. That's that's fantastic skills. Now uh, I don't know the answer to that, but um, would rotablation up front have made the case easier. I'm saying I'm I'm 
Um, I know it's a difficult question because you have extreme tortuosity as well as calcification, but I just wonder, obviously you, the balloon went up, but I wonder in, in, in hindsight whether uh, upfront rotablation in this, of these cases would make them you know, easier. Thanks. Uh, because of the extreme tortuosity, I don't think so it was a good option for me. And similarly, with a 2.5 balloon, I went with a high pressure and it was quite well expanded. So that was the reason that uh, I didn't opt for rotablation. It was the tortuosity, not the calcium at the moment. Because of the why there was the hardening phenomena, so nothing was going <clears throat> Okay, that's great. Well, look, we're, we're going to learn about rotablation in the uh, next uh, couple of cases. So we've got now with us um, Dr. Uh, Macon, who's going to present uh, rotablation, uh, do it early and enough or uh, regret later. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, uh, Dr. Macon join us for this uh, session. So the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Coronary calcification is rightly called nightmare of a cardiologist because it adds to the complexity of interventional procedure and makes delivery and deployment of stents a challenge. Uh, Dr. Khan, is, is Dr. Macken audible? He can is, we, yes. We, we, can, we can hear him loud and okay. clear. Okay, thanks. I will present two cases of severe coronary calcification. My first case was the 73 years of a gentleman who was diabetic, hypertensive, and presented with angina class 3. His labs were normal except keratin was 1.6. He was found to have calcific double vessel coronary artery disease with good LV function. He was offered cavic, but he was unwilling, and PCI to LED was planned with upfront rotation. This is the coronary angiogram. And we can see a lot of calcium we can see a lot of calcium in the balloon. Yeah, there, are, there is a lot of calcium in the plasma LED. And in the inside, inside, we can see in the still images that it's almost uh, angiographic sphere calcification because we can see the calcium on both sides of the vessel. This is the cranial view of the left system, and RCA is non dominant and small vessel. Because there was a lot of calcification, we wanted to quantify it, so we did an IVUS, but unfortunately, IVUS did not cross the, all the length of the lien. And the part of the lien that was imaged, we can see there is a circumferential calcification with more than 270 degree arc. So we decided to go for upfront rotor ablation. So we took the 1.25 rotor link bar, and after multiple rotor runs, the lien was very smooth and polishing run showed that the rotor crossed very easily. We pre-dilated the DNB 2.5 into 15 MC balloon and we deployed a 3 into 28 drug routing stand, but unfortunately stand didn't open up. We can clearly see that stand is under deployed in the mid course. So we tried to expand the stand with stand balloon at high pressure for a long time but still stand, calcium didn't give way and stand remained under deployed. Mm -hmm. But however, we were able to open it enough so that NC balloon would be able to cross through it. So we took different NC balloons for post dilatation, and we can see that still the balloon is not opened up and there is a dog bone in. So we, we still have an under deployed stand. So when we have an under deployed stand, what are the options available to us? You can leave it as such, but that is a recipe for stent thrombosis and ISR. The other option is to use an OPNC high pressure balloon that can lead to better trauma and perforation. That is the risk involved with that. We can use a laser with contrast, or we can rotablate the stent, but that is not a recommended option for newly deployed stent. So we decided to use the OPNC balloon, and we were getting ready with the laser with contrast if it doesn't work. But we were fortunate enough that the balloon opened up and we can clearly see that stent has opened up properly now. And this is the final image and we have good angiographic result. Although it was slightly turbulent flight, but fortunately it landed safely. And we had stable patient with us with good angiographic result. My second case was a 65 years of age lady who was non-diabetic, hypertensive, 
and she was admitted with unstable angina. At the middle of the night, patient were center chest pain that was restricted to multiple doses of IV analgesia and IV nitrates, and an emergent angiogram the due to PCI was planned. And patient was shifted to the catheter. This is the coronary angiogram. We can see that there is sphere angiographic calcification and long diffuse region in the mid LED. Initially, we crossed a wire and crossed the balloon, the uh, smallest balloon in the legion, but unfortunately, even the smallest available balloon could not cross the legion. So we are confronted with an uncrossable legion. So we plan to go for rota ablation, but the challenge here was how to exchange the rota wire. Should we use a microcatheter or steer the rota wire through the legion? A fine cross microcatheter was taken and we can clearly see that we are unable to cross through the legion and the guide is backing out. So it was decided to change and change another microcatheter which has better trackability and better crossability through the calcific legion. Either Corsair or Tornus or Turnpike Gold or we could use the laser that can be used on the same coronary wire without changing any other special wire. So we opted to use the Corsair. And cursor was spinned down into the lien, but unfortunately it got stuck in the lien and it was not possible to pull it back easily. But once it was being pulled back, the guy dived into the LED and we can see that there is plausible well LED dissection. And with this patient got chest pain and got unstable and restless. So we are confronted with multiple challenges. We have an unstable patient that is restless and has a lot of pain. There is proximal LED dissection. There is an uncrossable lesion downstream and no immediate help available at two o'clock at night. So what are the options? They hard. <laughs> Phone a friend and call for help. But who will come for the help at two o'clock at night? Or fix the devastating issue and then plan later. So the second part of LED was fixed with a stent and patient got a bit stable and chest pain vanished away and blood pressure improved. Now we are again confronted, confronted with the same challenge of an uncrossable and undilatable lien downstream. So what should be done next? How to change the rota wire? The option available to us is bend the microcatheter as far down as possible into the lien and then track down the rota floppy wire or use the laser, although laser is not a good option, in severe recalcitrant lesions. So it was decided to take a microcatheter, it was very deep into the lesion, and the, fortunately the rota wire was able to cross down the lesion. Now, we are confront, confronted with another challenge. How to track the rota wire down the vessel with freshly deployed stand? We have freshly deployed stand in transimal LED, and we have to rota wire the mid LED. So the option is push it down through the stand, but that didn't work. The other option was to dynaglide the bar through the stand. Use of dynaglide to advance the bar across the stand was opted and we can see that the bar crossed through the stand uneventfully. The distal lien was rota ablated while taking care of not bringing the rota back into the stand or parking into the deployed stand. After doing sufficient runs of rota ablation in the, in the uh, mid LED, we were able to deliver a stand in the intended place. And stand opened up nicely. Although it was a bumpy road, but fortunately we did reach the destination successfully and patient was stable and there is a good angiographic result. I conclude by saying that coronary calcification adds to the complexity of international procedures and appropriate use of ancillary equipment helps in successful stand delivery and deployment. Adequate rotabulation and lien preparation should be ensured before stand deployment. We, to ensure this, we can use imaging or we should do adequate pre-dilatation. Always be careful to avoid the deep diving of the guide while pulling the equipment out of coronary. And rotor pressure should be done upfront before any dissection or freshly deployed stand makes it more challenging. <coughs> However, there are ways and means to overcome such adversities. 
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, um, Nathan. That, those uh, two fantastic uh, cases and a good demonstration of how you uh, rotablate as well. Um, maybe I can ask uh, the, the first question about the first case. So, I mean, you'd clearly done IVUS up front uh, for the gentleman and, and confirmed that there was concentric calcification. And usually, if your IVUS probe doesn't pass, then in, that, in my books, that's an indication to proceed to rotablation. Uh, after you'd rotablated, it looked like it, you would use a 1.25 burr. The question is always, you know, for a proximal LAD, is that going to be undersized burr? And I think that is probably what had happened in your case. Uh, we know with uh, rotablation, you should probably target your burr to 50% of the size of the lumen. And if it's a proximal LAD, you can assume that it's going to be, uh, you know, three and a half millimeters. So I would probably have thought about a, a bigger burr. Uh, the only thing to say is that if you've already got your IVUS open on the table, then my practice uh, these days is to actually repeat the IVUS after I've done the rotablation to ensure that I've got some breaks uh, in the napkin ring calcification, because that's a, a good uh, suggestion that you'll be able to expand your uh, non-compliant balloons and not be left in this uh, situation where you've got an underexpanded stent. But I think you did all the right things uh, once you've found out that you had uh, stent regret there um, by going ahead and uh, post dilating with a, a, a high pressure OPN balloon. We're, we're fortunate in Europe that we have uh, the uh, intravascular lithotripsy balloon available to us, which I guess hasn't quite made its way into Asia yet. Um, but that's another option where you can perform uh, lithotripsy in these uh, cases. Um, uh, particularly if you've got underexpanded stent, but I know that you've got uh, laser available in your, your center. So that's probably what I would have done slightly differently in, in the first case to avoid that scenario uh, arising. Um, I don't know if any of my other colleagues uh, have got comments. Um, John, have you got? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, you know, the tip is when you've done your rotor is to pass a, a standard wire down past the, um, past the lesion uh, and, and dilate up with, pre-dilatation balloons, isn't it? And make, ensure you've got a, at least a 2.5 or a 3.0 balloon that will go right up. And if it won't, then you need another burr. Um, that's, the, that's the test, I think. Um, and then the, my, my other comment is that if, you know, they, those um, very high pressure balloons are, are, are great and get you out of a lot of problems. Uh, and you did that really well. Um, but you need a covered stent right next to you as you, uh, as you deploy them. Because when you let them down, occasionally you can get a, a very unpleasant rupture. Um, so yeah, use them by all means, but, but be aware that uh, you know you might have to get that uh, that covered stent down pretty quickly afterwards. It, it's, not, it's not often, but it, um, it's happened to me at least once. John, what do you think about uh, rotoblating uh, with dissection planes, which are clearly visible on the angiogram? I mean, the, the rotoblation itself will cause uh, dissection. Um, you know, sh is it an absolute contraindication? Would you say uh, to rotoblation? I always think it was, but I mean. I think most of us have had to do it at some stage and, and actually you seem to get away with it. So I think it's probably a, you know, you'd rather not do it, but I think when you have to, you, you can do it and it's probably much safer than we used to think it was. Mm. Uh, I, you know, go, go for it if you need to do it. Yeah. And certainly an, a neat trick in the second case where you dynaglide uh, yeah. the burr into the uh, recently deployed uh, stent that was a, a very neat trick it's a bit stupid with rotor all these years i've been struggling to get it here and there and actually the, the answer is just dynaglide it <laughs> why, why haven't we been doing it for years <laughs> yeah so, yeah uh, please go ahead uh, nada uh, these are two uh, wonderful cases and uh, very good uh, results in the end and uh, i agree with your and uh, professor townend's uh, comments regarding uh, uh, inflating it with a balloon after you've done a rotablation, uh, uh, a non-compliant balloon, and if it doesn't go up, then you either need to use a lithotripsy balloon uh, beforehand before deploying the stent, or you can even use a high pressure balloon at that particular time, which is a bit undersized, uh, and you can go up to 40 atmospheres before deploying the stent. Because after you've deployed a stent, uh, then it becomes even more difficult to sort of um, sort of expand the stent to its uh, normal caliber. 
So a combination of rotablation and uh, uh, balloon inflation or a lithotripsy balloon if you have it available. So it can be very useful. And uh, the second case was uh, again, excellent and a very good demonstration of rotablating through a stent and a very good result at the end. Thank Can you. I ask, uh, Macon, you know, I mean, you've obviously very experienced rotoblazer operator. Um, would you only pass a 1.25 uh, birth through a previously deployed stent or recently deployed stent, or would you be happy passing a, a bigger birth through that as well? Can you please repeat the question exactly what you want to Yes, say? Uh, I, I'm just asking about uh, when you're burring through a recently deployed stent, uh, you know, would you be happy and comfortable taking a burr which is bigger than a 1.25 or would you only stick to a 1.25 burr when you're uh, left with no options but having to need to do that? Um, I was more comfortable using 1.25 bar because it's smaller in size and the chances of uh, damaging the freshly depressed stand are less likely as compared to using the bigger bar. So I would prefer a smaller bar in this situation. And if we see the distal vessel as well, uh, it's not a big vessel, so 1.25 was adequate in that respect. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the thing to say that the 1.25 bar is slightly different shape to the other burrs, so it's got a, a thinner head. Uh, and the reason I, I mention that is that you can sometimes get caught out with this burr because you can end up with a, with the burr uh, sticking uh, past the lesion because it's crossed the lesion, but then not able to bring it back. This is known as the uh, Kokishi phenomenon, and it's named after a, a Japanese doll, which has a, a very big head, but a small neck and uh, body. Um, and I remember we published a case a, a few years ago about how to get yourself out of a difficult situation when, when you do get a rotor burr uh, stuck. But fortunately, uh, you got away with it and didn't get that stuck. So really well done. Um, uh, what uh, I think we're, we're running uh, short on time. So uh, can I just congratulate uh, all of uh, the presenters uh, we've shared uh, six fantastic cases here uh, today, three from uh, Pakistan, three from uh, the UK. So a big thank you to all the presenters uh, for taking part. Um, and a big thank you to uh, Mosin for being uh, a co-moderator with myself uh, this morning. Well, mo morning in the UK, but afternoon and evening uh, in Asia. I'm going to hand over now to uh, uh, General uh, Fahan, who's the Commandant at the uh, AFIC uh, for his uh, final thoughts and words. So over to you, uh, please, uh, General Fahan. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sail. <clears throat> I'm sure this uh, webinar between uh, UK and Pakistan has been a great experience for all the participants. And uh, we have had very interesting and great cases. And starting with your case, uh, I think DK Gresh, we were expecting, but then there was a kink and you dealt with the kink of uh, Ampella device uh, uh, totally in, in a great manner. And that was a great case. Then we had a rather simple case presented by Barrier Samor, <clears throat> but then uh, he had to change his strategy. One has to learn once once doing these left main angioplasties that we have, one has to be conversing with the two stand techniques we do work before. Uh, one can you know start ramping uh, left main stem cases. Uh, then we again had a um, uh, case with, um, presented by Professor uh, Townend. And I think these days nobody will leave a LED dissection is a long LED dissection. Most young people will try and stand, but he being a very old and experienced operator, he knew that uh, if he can <laughs> leave this LED, uh, he would still be paid enough for say a couple of months because he has been doing easy from the time when uh, Poba was the you know, state of the art. So but that was again a very fresh experience. Uh, again, you know, it reminded us of the old days. And then again, he showed us that uh, once you stand the vessel when it's undersized, it can lead to ISR. And when it's in August, uh, actual RT was, uh, you know, uh, quite big. So that uh, emphasizes the importance of imaging these days. And imaging has become actually a big part of uh, angioplasty now. Then we had. Uh, uh, that case of uh, retrograde angioplasty, I don't know where he, uh, from where he created that new osteum of the RCA, and he did not end up having any problem. There was no leakage, and uh, I'm still scratching my head. Uh, how could good you, you know, have that in this case, and <laughs> the patient remained stable. And then we had do these uh, tortuous case from Prabhupada uh, Ali. 
I think he managed this case uh, in a, a fantastically well. So it was a very challenging, uh, tortuous case. And then when he had a dissection, the patient had a blood pressure of 30. I think only a cool band like Ali would have, you know, uh, retrieved that patient. Uh, one, I once again congratulate Ali for the, doing this case. And then these two uh, rotor ablation cases, again, you know, again, uh, very challenging and exciting cases. I, I personally, I think everybody has uh, learned something out of this uh, seminar uh, today. Uh, I think this corona has really changed our practice for the last one year. We used to be together in the conferences and sharing these cases. And there has been very little opportunity of exchanging uh, information and cases. And this has been a great opportunity for, for people uh, who have attended this case and for us at AFSE and uh, for, I'm sure, for the Birmingham Hospital. Uh, I, I would in that, I would like to thank all the participants for, uh, for attending this case and sharing and learning such great cases. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, thanks once again, and uh, a big thank you to all the audience. I, uh, I hope you've enjoyed the uh, cases that we've uh, shared for you. And uh, once the airways open up again, I, I'm sure uh, we'll meet uh, once again in person. Uh, so I'm going to end the uh, seminar and webinar here um, this uh, afternoon. Uh, thank you once again for, for joining us. Mm -hmm.